Okay, so staying on the subject of puppets, um, we'll take a look at this clown here. <laughs> I'm going to show you a clip of Ed Miliband. What's important is not what he says, but how many times he says it. Just watch this. These strikes are wrong at a time when negotiations are still going on. But parents and the public have been let down by both sides because the government has acted in a reckless and provocative manner. After today's disruption, I urge both sides to put aside the rhetoric, get round the negotiating table and stop it happening again. Um, I listened to your speech in Rex and you talked about the Labour Party being a movement. A lot of people in that movement uh, are the people who are on strike today and they'll be looking at you and thinking, well, you're describing these strikes as wrong. Why aren't you giving us more leadership as a leader of the Labour movement? At a time when negotiations are still going on, I do believe these strikes are wrong. And that's why I say both sides should, after today's disruption, get round the negotiating table, put aside the rhetoric and sort the problem out. Because the public and parents have been let down by both sides. The government's acted in a reckless and provocative manner. Well, I spoke to Francis Moore before I came here and the tone he was striking was a very conciliatory one. Do you think there's a difference between the words they're saying in public and the attitude they're striking in private in these negotiations? Are there negotiations in good faith, would you say? What I say is that the strikes are wrong when negotiations are still going on, but the government has acted in a reckless and provocative manner in the way it's gone about these issues. After today's disruption, I urge both sides to get around the negotiating table, put aside the rhetoric, and stop this kind of thing happening again. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a statement you've made uh, publicly and you'll make to me, and this will be broadcast, obviously, but have you spoken privately to any uh, union leaders and, and expressed your view to them on a personal level, would you say? Well, what I say in public and in private to everybody involved in this is get round the negotiating table, put aside the rhetoric and stop this kind of action happening again. These strikes are wrong because negotiations are still going on but parents and the public have been let down by the government as well who've acted in a reckless and provocative manner. Um, you're a parent, I'm a parent, a lot of people watching this will be parents. Um, has it affected you personally, this action? Has it affected your family, your friends? I mean, and, and what is the net effect of that going to be on, on parents having to take a day off work today? I think parents up and down the country have been affected by this action. Uh, and it's wrong at a time when negotiations are still going on. Parents have been let down by both sides because the government has acted in a reckless and provocative manner. I think that both sides should, after today's disruption, get round the negotiating table, put aside the, the rhetoric, rhetoric and stop, stop this kind of thing. Again. Again. Yeah. Oh, wait. Five times. Five times he said exactly the same thing. Now, what that tells me is that those words have been written down and pretty much learned. And I would ask the question, who has written those words? Has he written them and learned them? Someone else written them and learned them. If someone else has written them and he learned them, that means he's 100% a puppet. But let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he wrote them down and learned them. Is that the behaviour of a leader? Not in my opinion. The only thing that we should be saying to the likes of Ed Mil Miliband, and I would include David Cameron, Theresa May, and Hagen, and a lot of them, the only question we should be getting involved with them is take me to your leader. That's it. Because he's not the leader and neither is David Cameron. And this is what we need to be exposing in British politics. The fact that they're all puppets who, uh, and are answerable to unseen um, puppet masters. Take me to your leader. And what, ab what about the interviewer there, the journalist, who sat there and happily listened to the same answer five times? He's part of the same puppet show. So our media is, are just as much to blame for the, for the trash that they get that they present us with all right now <clears throat> I suspect that those who are running the show who are manipulating people like Ed Miliband and David Cameron the real power in our country are also running a subversion and demoralization campaign and they're using the law they're using the media and various other uh, strands in order to demoralize the public with the intention of making the public impotent and not capable of opposing certain decisions that are going on behind the scenes. And I come to this conclusion because I've looked at the work of Yuri Bezmanov. Bezmanov was a former KGB agent who defected to the West in the 1980s and he gave lectures on how Soviet Union were trying to demoralize their population in order to subvert and destabilize them so that they can be steered in any direction, right? And then controlled, become subservient to the state. 
And you've only got to look at his subversion charts to see so many striking similarities between what's going on in Britain today and what they were doing in Soviet Russia. So I'm going to just give a few quick examples. In education, he said that we need to create permissiveness, which is a lack of rules, resulting in ignorance. In the media, monopolize and manipulate it to create an uninformed myopia. Myopia meaning you're not able to see the big picture. I think we've definitely got an uninformed myopia on the Madeleine McCann case because the media has been manipulated and monopolized. All the proof of that is in my documentaries. But that's not the only subject where we have a manipulated media. The London bombings, 9-11, the list is endless. And we do have an uninformed myopia, anyone who believes what they read in tabloid newspapers. So there's another example of where Yuri Bezmenov's chart is lining up with what's going on in Britain today. Um, in culture, create false heroes and role models. Pop idol, Premier League footballers. On every poster that you come past is Premier League footballers. Are they really the heroes of today? They're false heroes and role models. Okay, now, in the area of life, and I'm going to drill down into this area, family and society break it up in order to create loyalty to the state. Now, I think in Western democracies, it's not just loyalty to the state, I think there's loyalty to corporations as well, because they're promoting consumerist materialism. They're trying to get people to overconsume, uh, which ties into this one here, of health, create junk food, and then ending up in, with enfeebled masses. You've just got to look around you to, to realize that people are not living healthy lifestyles and ask the question, is that a manipulation or is it by accident? I say it's by manipulation. So let's just look at these areas, areas of breaking up the family and breaking up society. Just imagine that society is this wall and you are one brick in it. We're all functioning together as a society. This is what they were trying to do in Soviet Russia. Demoralize you. Make you feel isolated. Now, if you're going to um, chop that wall up, one way of doing it is to identify certain groups of people and then make the rest of society detest them or hate them. So this is what they're doing. They're identifying particular groups in society and they're producing television documentaries in order to get people to hate them. Now, let's just say that these green blocks represent people on benefits. I showed this clip in my last talk. I'm going to show it again. What is the psychological effect of this type of documentary? <laughs> Julie and Vinny Bienvenue are also experts on life on the door. I, I need a bit. No. I really need a bit. Yeah. I, I need a bit. These newlyweds are part of Britain's record number of long term unemployed. No work for more than six years. And their only hard graft is working the system. People find it easier to live off the government because they, they get most of the things paid for them. And yeah, it is easy doing that. And then you've got people that don't want work and can't be asked, and they find it easy to claim benefit. And I don't know how they justify that. I am in that position, yeah. I'll hold my hands up, yeah. At the end of the day, you'd be better off going for the VIP one because it's all it's included. Julie and Vinny want more. Julie gets sickness benefit, 310 quid a fortnight. All of Vinnie and Julie's nine children are living on benefits. They're the next welfare generation. Julie has to ring up the Dole office to check just how much cash they've got coming in. But can you possibly tell me how much will be in, uh, going into my bank, please? <laughs> and with unexpected cash in the bank, it's time to spend. Hopefully I can get me money out. But they spend more on fags and their TV package than they do on food and other basics. Housing benefit is one of the largest chunks of Britain's welfare bill. <laughs> The cheeky <laughs> Vinny has secured the new home they wanted in the space of just a few days. I'm fucking left I'll, I'll, I'll have a coffee. Julie hasn't had a job for six years. But the future's bright for Julie and Vinny in Liverpool. It's an arrangement that somehow gets them more benefits. And the cable TV man is back. So, spirits are high. <laughs> Short of getting a job, life couldn't be rosier. <laughs> now, these documentaries are very successful. People who get taken in by them, are sp they spit poison at the people who've been duped to take part in them. And they have been duped to take part in them. Because this is the poster that Channel 5 used to recruit people for that documentary. 
What is life really like on benefits? Channel 5 is making a new documentary series looking at what life is really like when you live on benefits. We are offering individuals and families the opportunity to speak about their personal experiences. Do you struggle to survive? Are there no jobs in your hometown? Do you think the system is generous enough? This was actually on a wall in a pub in Merthyr Tidville. I took a photograph of it. It doesn't say, are you on benefits and proud? No one is on benefits and proud, let's face it. Right? So these documentaries, they're not exposés of people who are working the system. They're there to make you hate a large section of the population in order to demoralise. I mean, you've just got to go into the news, the news agents any day and you'll see um, benefit bashing stories. I blow my benefits on baby spray tans. Is that really the expose of someone who's abusing their, uh, their benefits? I don't think so. There's an ulterior motive. Now, I wanted to find out what other TV shows people find subversive, so I put this um, appeal out recently. I'm starting a Rich Planet League table of the most subversive shows on television. So if you want to suggest which programs you think are being subversive and why, please go to this link where you can post your suggestion and tell me which TV program you think is the most deviously manipulative on television. I will then compile a league table of TV shows which are considered by viewers to be the most dangerous to the mind and being used to subvert. If you need some advice on where to start, why not try Channel 5's documentaries, which are a cesspit of half-truths and use highly selective editing to present blatantly orchestrated semi-fictional narratives as some kind of real-life documentary. I'd rather watch CAC. Okay. So... Here are the results of that survey. I got about 100 replies to that appeal. There we go. BBC News, number one. The most subversive programme on television as voted by Rich Planet viewers. So I've got some comments here. These are comments from Rich Planet viewers. They're not my comments. I can vouch for the demoralising effect it has on me, often overhearing only a single sentence of the horrors bandied so professionally on any news BBC News program is enough to sink my mood sometimes for the day. It goes without saying that BBC One News is the worst bit of behavioural nudging in a single program. BBC News is the most corrupt and subversive broadcast in the world. EastEnders, like having an open sewer in your living room. EastEnders is stuffed with social engineering. I used to watch it, but then after a couple of years, saw it again. Baby being taken from your mo young mother, married men acting like horny schoolboys. It demoralizes the population to make them think that this is how most people live, or the younger generation, to implant the belief that security and stability aren't a part of the family anymore. EastEnders is part of a mind control program to lower the mental ability and standard social behaviour of the mass British public. EastEnders seems to glorify and normalise criminality, family breakup, selfishness, general slobbish behaviour in a way that I had not seen in previous shows. EastEnders is where it all started to change and I have no doubt that the now deplorable BBC is complicit in the deliberate subversion of society. The BBC as a whole now seems to be a massive and expensive instrument of mind control. Coronation Street was quite light and fun in the late 1980s, but then seemed to turn nasty as well. The millions of people who watch this sort of drivel are being subtly mind controlled over decades to accept the sorts of behaviour which in the long term can only be detrimental to society as a whole. And due to the early evening scheduling, children have grown up thinking this sort of thing is normal. Emmerdale is soap about a small yet completely amoral population in North Yorkshire. It makes the Wicker Man look like the Archers. <laughs> Anyone not seen the Wicker Man, I recommend you watch it. <laughs> Everything is accompanied by copious amounts of booze. The cast jump into bed with each other on the first meeting, then discuss their sex lives with all and sundry. Theft, drug dealing, drug taking and carjacking are all pardonable for our heroes. It is shown at 7pm when children are having their tea. Not good role models. Like many people, I used to be young, but it would have been much more fun if only I had moved to Emmerdale. <laughs> Still, I suppose I would have been safer on Elm Street, as, as I left out all the murders and psycho serial killers they have on there. The traditional family unit is no more. Dysfunctional relationships seem to be the norm. Violence and sexual innuendo all designed to confuse young people's minds. EastEnders, Corrie Emmerdale and all the other soaps have a cancer victim or two. 
Are we being prepared for something? A new norm, perhaps, where everyone knows someone with cancer. I try not to watch the soaps, Richard, but she never has them off, so I'm forced to see and hear them. We're going to come on to that comment. It may be just coincidence that all the soap actors are riddled with cancer at the same time, but I highly doubt it. Some people actually think that um, this law of attraction, I think it's called, where if you spend all your days watching people with cancer and worrying about it, you increase your chances of getting it. Mind over matter. Is that the case? I don't know. Um, now, question time, that would get my vote, number three on the list as the most subversive program on television. The questions are rigged. These are Rich Planet viewers' comments. After attempting to watch Question Time for the first time in a while, last night's show put the end to it for me. It is a blatantly controlled format, even down to the fixed questions and the fact the audience members need to apply to attend. I would say that one of the most subversive programs on television is Question Time, in particular because it is hosted by David Dimbleby, one person who I would guarantee is on a second payroll. So what the, uh, the viewer means there is he thinks that David D Dimbleby is working for MI5. Now, we know that Jon Snow, um, another news anchor, was offered uh, his salary doubled to work for MI5. And he turned them down and he blew the whistle on them. But it, I suspect that the vast majority, or if not all, of BBC anchors are working for MI5. They're not really working for the, uh, the licence pair. Some questions are not allowed and some speakers are kicked out. Top of the list, BBC Question Time. In my opinion, all the people in the audience are pre-selected to ask questions. It sticks out like the sore thumb. So they're saying that not just the person who reads out the question on the card to kick the debate off, they're saying that there's people planted in the audience. Now, Question Time discussed the issue of fracking uh, early last year in Blackburn. Now, fracking is where they, they're putting high-pressure water and sand deep into the earth in order to fracture the rock to try and get gas out. It's highly controversial. I've written to my MP saying to him that it's madness that they're doing this. They should not be doing it. It's highly environmentally destructive in a small country like the UK. Um, but it seems that they're trying to introduce it. And there's a huge argument going on about, about it, um, pro-fracking and anti-fracking. But I think there's a huge lie being orchestrated about this. And I'm going to explain why. This estimate for fracking only came about at the beginning of 2013 when the BGS, that's the British Geological Survey, they brought out new figures on the amount of shale gas available underneath the UK. Right? So this is their 2013 estimate. But strangely, before 2013, the figure was absolutely minuscule. 2013 figures is between 1,300 and 1,600 trillion cubic feet. So if you get 10% of that out, you feed it into houses, you're looking at between 110 and 140 years supply. That's what they're saying. This was their new 2013 estimates. But in 2012, their estimate was just 5.3 trillion cubic feet, which equates to only four and a half months' use. Now, I've discussed this with a very switched-on geologist. The first thing he said was, the BGS are just an arm of government. You can't trust them. They're not an independent organization. And they're all we are relying on for this huge figure of gas. Now the other thing about the BGS is they have been used to put out disinformation in the past. They have lied in the past. 1974 in Wales an object crash landed in the Berwyn Mountains. Right? The army were on top of it very very quickly. Uh, they tidied up the area and they took whatever it was away. I don't know what it was. Some people think it was a UFO. I haven't gotten a clue what it was. But the local people were very curious about it, so what the government did was they got the BGS to write bogus reports and tell people that it was an earthquake. There was no earthquake uh, on the 23rd of January 1974 in the Berwyn Mountains. It was an object which crash-landed. Right? So the government rely on the BGS to put out their lies. So I question this figure hugely. The other thing the geologist said was there is no way you, can extract, you would be able to extract 10%. You're lucky if it's 1%, he said to me. So... To me, this is a huge exaggeration. I, I would actually go as far as to say that gas extracted from fracking cannot um, make any significant difference in the energy mix of the UK. I think it's, it's just not viable, in my opinion. So the claims have been vastly exaggerated by this anti-fracking lobby where they're putting blockades up at fracking plants and they're trying to get the argument whipped up. In my opinion... Um, 
the amount of realistically extractable gas is being gro grossly exaggerated. And I've been pondering over this question for quite some time now. Uh, now, in my last talk, I suggested that it could be being done to create an investment bubble. This is where they get lots of investors to put their money into fracking technology, and then in five years' time, they, they announce, well, there wasn't as much gas as we thought, and all that money is then stolen, effectively. But someone contacted me, and they said, well, have you thought about currency wars, Richard? It could be linked to that. It's quite a complicated issue, but one thing that they can do is back currency with commodities. So the dollar was backed by gold in the 1970s, and it's possible to have energy-backed currency. Right? So you could back the pound with gas. So on, 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 the, um, on the reasoning that there's so much gas under Britain, it would be possible to strengthen the pound by saying, well, every pound is worth so much gas. That is something that they could do. Let's just say that they did that, and then in five years' time they announce, oh, we were wrong, there's no gas. What happens to the pound? Great way of getting Britain into the euro, because they're not going to get Britain into the euro by a vote. Okay? So that's a theory I'm just throwing out there. I don't know if I'm right on that. But I, th I think this battle in fracking is being done for an ulterior motive. And just watch this debate. Why can't communities affected by fracking have blocking powers as those offered to those near wind farms? Uh, uh, yes, and for people still confused about what fracking is, the word actually comes from fracturing rock. And it's pouring water and sand and chemicals into rock and then producing gas from it. And you remember there was a great scare about whether this would cause earthquakes. All right, so there's a little debate about it. And the, the fixed bit, I think, is fixed, is at the end of the debate. There are so, two people, one in front of the other. I guess one... So he says, two people, one in front of the other. There's three people with their hands up all together. There's a woman over here. So he says, I'm going to have you, then I'm going to have you, and then I'm going to have this woman over here. So he knows who he's going to ask. I get around the back first, that's you, and then I come to you in front, yes. We need to take some tough decisions now on what we have as our future energy mix, because if we don't, we're going to have power cuts, we're going to we'll have blackouts in the future, so we need to make those decisions now, rather than waiting, you know, another 20 years before starting Are you in favour of, of fracking? I'm in favour of, of, of a large mix of different energy okay. uh, sources. Right, that's not a question. Would you, is that what you would ask if you went on question time? I'm in favour of a large mix of energy sources. It's not the question I would ask. That is a contextual comment, in my opinion, which is a setup for the next two questions. And you, sir? The northwest of England is uh, obviously struggling uh, really, really bad with this recession. Uh, this fracking is going to bring uh, a lot of uh, jobs into the area. Uh, it's going to give a security for a great number of years. The esti estimates is that there's somewhere in the region about six or seven trillion cubic feet of gas that we need to get it out. We need the money in the, in the northwest All of right. Parliament. You're being it would be hard pushed to find anyone in Blackburn in favour of fr fracking because they've been affected by it. There was an earthquake which a lot of people said was caused by the house prices have come down. So just randomly choosing a member of the audience, you're not going to get a pro-fracking person. You're, you're objecting to that. What, what are you saying? Absolutely. It's not bringing jobs in. There's well, been four wells fracked in the file. Two have failed. No inquiry why they failed. No fines. No regulations. I believe the HSE has been to the, never been to these sites for two years. The, there's terrible things happening in America, in Australia, in Canada. We've had people over telling us about what they've had. People, people are breathing these gases in. There's, all these chemicals are in the ground. Some of them are coming out. We've got to have proper regulations. Margaret James. Can, Well, I quite agree there does need to be regulation and there does need to be, some, there does need to be um, a look at the safety implications, but we cannot afford as a country, we can't afford in the North West and we certainly can't afford as a country to reject this opportunity. I think we've got to look to see if we can make it work. It has made such a huge difference to the, to the economy but is she in the right United right that it's States? already gone wrong? It's, it's you're you're, you're gone behind. Wrong. The, hold on, you can't, Matthew, because I haven't Absolutely brought in Emerson. wrong. What? It's gone wrong. Emerson, wow. do you have about this? Uh, I think that local people are the only people who can stop these things. Look at all the lies that they were told in the 1950s about nuclear power stations. Now people riddle with cancer and all sorts of horrible yes. diseases. They'll lie and lie and lie to you and you're the Absolutely. only people who can stop them. Very brief. See, I just look at Dimbleby in instances like this. Dimbleby knows. 
Fracking is, you've got to be much more careful. Manipulate that whole debate, Dimbleby. It's a beneficial effect. Is we are a much smaller and much more heavily populated country, and in America they can do it well away from population centres. Okay. If you start doing it in the northwest, you get it rippling all the way up the valley. 1,500 uh, feet, away. feet away from a school. Exactly. OK, well, we've heard the point. And, uh, but we I'm never get... Uh, why are we not getting our voices heard? Your, your voice... Oh, no, Everybody no, no, no. is not your voice, wanting it to be heard. Your voice has been heard by <laughs> over three... Pen now, compare that with 9-11 campaigners. Have you ever seen a 9-11 campaigner given that much voice on question time? No way. Or 7-7 or other issues? So, in my opinion, they need this argument for some reason. Okay. So, I don't know what's going on with this frackness issue, but I, I smell a big pork pie. Okay. Let's look at some other th um, programs which people suggest are subversive. So daytime chat type shows this morning, Breakfast TV, The One Show, Loose Women. Anyone watch that? No one prepared to admit it, eh? <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, the One Show often have little tidbits of false information that offer an extremely narrow viewpoint with little or no alternative view. They will often frown upon any alternative views and gesture that these views are obviously stupid and incorrect. Um, Jeremy Kyle, well that goes without saying. Um, diet and cookery type programs are subversive according to some. Uh, MasterChef, the music and general presentation promotes a feeling of submission and is used in a trance-like effect. Uh, and you've just got to look at Yuri Bezmenov's subversion chart to realize that, that diet and health is part of a subversion or was in the Soviet Union. Promote junk food and create enfeebled masses. Enfeebled masses do not rise up against the government. I'm very curious about the rise of Greggs, Greggs the Bakers, yeah? yeah? It's overnight. Um, they even have the Greggs logo. You know the blue motorway signs, highways agency, official signs? The Greggs logo on there. And when I read the highway code when I was revising for my, um, you know, their driving test, I don't remember seeing those Greggs signs on the blue motorway signs. That's got to be approved from, from government because those signs are, he are heavily regulated. Um, in Newcastle upon Tyne, where all the nightclubs are, there's a Greg's in the middle of there now. It's open until three in the morning. They've even got a bouncer. <laughs> He's 25 stone. <laughs> mm. So Greg's is junk food in disguise. It is junk food. It's in disguise with the odd bit of lettuce and tomato, but it is junk food. So the, these, the manipulators that are running this subversion agenda, um, they're not interested in money, right? Because you would say, oh, well, that's just a successful baker's, Richard. It's just a company that's done well through advertising and expanded itself across the country, right? Now, I've no doubt that the managing director of Greg's probably believes that, but I think the people above him who run the central banks where money is no object to them. It is not, because they print the money, right? Um, as, long as, as long as you do your job, Mr. Greggs, make people fat, you will continue to be a success. The subverters at the top don't really care about the money. <clears throat> All right, country file. BBC country fi files. Uh, even programs that you think are innocent are subversive. Sunday tea time, thinly veiled exploitation of Britain's pastoral instincts in order to soften and subvert the mindset such that concepts like climate change, renewable energy, GMO foods become indoctrinated. Agenda 21 will then be much easier for people to accept. Now, somebody has nominated Crime Watch. This is a still from Crime Watch UK, October last year. And it's a reconstruction of the Madeleine McCann case, where we've got actors playing uh, Jerry McCann and Kate McCann, and they're at the Tapas restaurant, um, allegedly just before uh, Madeline's gone missing. And what they're doing is they keep putting their knives and forks down and they trot off to the apartment to check on the kids. I don't think any of that happened. Um, we've only got their statements for that, and they have stuck quite close together. There's no other evidence that they were going checking on children. Now, <clears throat> I'm just going to ask a question here, this programme as I say, it aired in October last year. How much money do you think this costs to produce? It's un under one hour long BBC 
Crime Watch UK, reconstruction of the Madeleine McCann thing. Anyone, anyone like to guess how much money that cost to make? <laughs> That's a lot. Any others? <laughs> Say again. Two million. Two million. Well, one million pound. One million pound of your money, right? Now, go, go, back, go back and watch it on YouTube and then watch my film and you decide yourself which one you think is nearest the truth, right? People have called me a money-making crackpot for trying to make that documentary or for making that documentary. One million pound in order to try and convince you that Madeleine was abducted. Subversion. <coughs> now, I've not mentioned children's programs, but obviously they do influence young people's minds. One guy voted for Peppa Pig. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> so I haven't got kids. Now, he said, I nominate Peppa Pig. It targets the very young and impressionable. Its creators are supported by Channel 5 and Nick Jr. So I didn't know what it was, so I thought, well, let's find out. I'm Peppa Pig. This is my little brother, George. This is Mummy Pig. And this is Daddy Pig. <laughs> oh, that's enough of that. Right. Now, and he goes on to say, it promotes an attitude towards Daddy as silly, or makes out Daddy as incompetent at most things, primarily from Pepper, the daughter. This, I believe, eats at the true foundations of the relationship capabilities of father and daughter. I've had my daughter, quote Pepper, belittling me for no reason, but with true conviction. It was teaching her and all little girls that their fathers aren't really that clever, always make mistakes, and generally are not a good choice for advice. It breaks that subconscious connection between father and daughter. So this is a guy who's really annoyed at, th at th these programs because it breaks his subconscious connection between him and his three-year-old daughter. And here are some examples. Gosh! Daddy Pig! You've had this book out for ten years! Naughty Daddy! Sorry, Miss Rabbit. Daddy, we don't want to get lost. Are we lost? Uh, yes. Well, I can run as far as you like. But, Daddy, you can hardly run at all. And you must remember to bring your book back too, Daddy Pig. <laughs> I'll make sure Daddy remembers. What if I practice eating today, then practice running tomorrow? No, Daddy. You need to practice running now. <laughs> Silly Daddy, that's just a drawing. Poor Daddy, <coughs> having to go to work. Oh, poor Daddy. <laughs> Come on, let's play. We've lost our engine. Lost your engine? Yes, <coughs> it's completely disappeared. I'd like to help, but I don't know a thing about engines. I'm probably just being silly. This looks a bit like an engine. Ah, yes. Where shall I put Delphine's luggage? In my room, at the very top of the house. Oh. <laughs> Did you get the envelope? He can't hear you, Daddy. He's on television. Oh, yes, of course. It's a walking, talking snowman. <laughs> oh, it's just... Daddy. So this has sold seven and a half million DVDs in the UK. It goes out in 180 countries. Uh, and it certainly affected one father's relationship with his three-year-old daughter. And it's probably affecting millions of fathers' relationships with their three-year-old daughters. You have to ask the question, is this content being put in deliberately for purposes of subversion, as suggested by Yuri Bezmenov? Because one thing that he says about subversion is people think subversive practices go on in the background. No, no. They're always in your face, subversion. It's always in your face. Okay? I would suggest that is subversive. Highly damaging, in my opinion. Okay. Now we come on to Operation U Tree, which is another can of worms. Um, I don't know whether this was an attempt to uh, arrest and charge genuine abusers or whether it was a psychological operation from word go. But you have to agree that the, what, that the newspaper headlines from this were sensationalizing it, right? Because the overriding thing which comes, that came from the media with these stories, not just Rolf Harris, other people as well, is 
you can't trust anyone now. You can't even trust Rolf Harris. That's the message it's sending out. Now, that wall that I had up earlier on, where the people are bricks, the cement in there is trust. That's what the cement is. Trust is what holds families together and society together. And stories like that break down trust. And you have to ask the question, is that being put out deliberately to break down trust as part of a Soviet-style uh, subversion technique? Or is it just, uh, just by random? I would suggest it's being done deliberately. going to talk about a psychological operation which took place recently but I'm not going to tell you what it is anyone who can guess what it is shout out and I'll give you a free copy of my film now I spoke in the last talk about the empire which is currently trying to engulf the world trying to take over the world and create a one world government and it has used 9-11 uh, and 7-7 as an excuse to take over the Middle East uh, and I went through the countries that have had regime change since 9-11. So we had the invasion of Afghanistan, we had the invasion of Iraq, we had the deposing of, of um, Colonel Gaddafi, and various other countries in this region uh, also had regime change. Here they are. Now some people say, well, there th was revolutions in some of those countries. I disagree with that. I think that there were Asian provocateurs that triggered all of those regime changes to make them more compliant to the US agenda. There were countries which did not need to be changed that were already um, pro-US, we'll colour them in. We're left with three countries which are undoubtedly targets of the US. Syria, there was a vote in Parliament last year to determine whether we were going to invade and take military action against Syria, a country that's got nothing to do with the UK. We've got no right in that country to, um, to go into it militarily. Iran, rhetoric about Iran's alleged nuclear programme, Pakistan, they've been dropping uh, drone attacks willy-nilly on that country. So those three countries are definitely targeted. Now, let's just look at the modus operandi of the group that's doing this, the group that is, that is creating regime change across the world. Right? Their modus operandi, whoever they are, they've targeted countries with a low approval of the US, Islamic and undemocratic, what we would consider dictatorships. They're the types of countries they've gone for. And they've always manufactured excuses and put it, planted them in our media before they've gone into those countries. Okay? Now I'm going to list some of their um, excuses that they've manufactured. So they used the excuse of 9-11 to invade Afghanistan. They used weapons of mass destruction to invade Iraq, which they didn't have. Uh, they've used Lockerbie to uh, demonize Libya. Libya had absolutely nothing to do with Lockerbie. There's no evidence that Libya were involved in that. But, the, but Lockerbie was plastered all over our newspapers before they deposed Gaddafi. Um, chemical weapons is the rhetoric coming out about Syria and Iran is nuclear weapons. So there's the modus operandi. They go for countries with a low US approval, Islamic, non-democratic, and they always think of an excuse. Now let's just say for the sake of argument that this group which is trying to bring about a one world government uh, chooses Southeast Asia as its next target. So we'll look at point one on my chart and ask which countries um, have a low US approval rating. Let's look at Burma. So the green represents how many people in that country approve of the US regime. So in Burma it's... Say again? Are you talking about projects that are in American century? Um, well, that, that links into this, yeah. Sadism? No. 
So in Thailand, there is a 60% U.S. approval rating. In Vietnam, 71% of the population approve of Barack Obama in the U.S. In Cambodia, it's 62. In the Philippines, it's 85. In Malaysia, it's 34. In Indonesia, it's 38. So that's what that, those group of countries think of the U.S. Now let's look at religion, point two on the list. Which of these are Islamic countries? Because they're the countries that they go for. Malaysia and Indonesia are predominantly Islamic. The rest are Buddhist, think the Philippines is Roman Catholic. Now let's look at um, democracy. Which of these countries are the most or least democratic? Well, you can actually look on the Global Democracy Ranking website, and Britain is position 10, the United Kingdom, this is America. And right at the bottom, the lowest one of all those countries in Southeast Asia is Malaysia. So, which country is going to be targeted in that region? We've got Islamic countries, the lowest U.S. approval rating, and the least democratic. They're going to target Malaysia, in my opinion, if they're going to go into that re region and regime change it. But the modus operandi, as I explained before, they need a reason to go into Malaysia. Yeah? No one's going to believe Malaysia have got nuclear weapons. Hmm, what can we do? Yeah. The, 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 anyone actually believe that the CIA or NORAD did not know where that missing Malaysian flight was? There are so many devices on that airplane which report back to Rolls-Royce, Boeing, um, CIA, NORAD would have to have known where that missing airline was. In my opinion, all those news reports are complete bullshit. The US knew where that missing airliner was. In my opinion, this is an attempt to make Malaysia look like a tin pot dictatorship, just to nudge the public's perception um, into the view that, that Malaysia's regime really needs to be gotten rid of. Now, Barack Obama went to visit the Malaysian Prime Minister round about the time that the, well, when this Malaysian airliner was supposedly missing. And he was, all the usual rhetoric, rhetoric, you know, the US is doing everything it can to help the Malaysian authorities find this missing plane. What a lie. Does anyone see anything in the body language of these photographs? I think Obama knows that Malaysia is on the list. And Malaysia did hold public hearings sort of a mock trial where they put George Bush on trial for war crimes and they voted him uh, guilty and they put that on state television, right? Now we've had other negative stories coming out of Malaysia or stories that have come out of Malaysia that have been, had a negative twist put on them. So we had the, this guy, um, Gareth Huntley, went missing and then he's found in the jungle. Now what does that newspaper photograph say to you? It says to me, there's some kind of militaristic regime that we can't really trust and it's putting in danger our attractive western people so it's, it's a dangerous area. That, that's what that says to me. Um, and there were reports that he'd supposedly had his throat slit but I don't think there's been any post-mortem evidence of that. Um, obviously it's a tragic story. Um, now, I read one newspaper report of the recent thing in, in the Ukraine, which said that, the, the, again, another Malaysian plane, they said, well, Malaysia are obviously partly to blame because they shouldn't have flown that plane over a war zone. So, again, they're using these stories to demonize Malaysia, and that, this story made me laugh. Um, this was just a few weeks ago. Mystery of British honeymooner who was being quizzed by police after he disappeared for two days in Malaysia, leaving his new bride frantic. So, guy gets married, goes on holiday um, to Kuala Lumpur, has an argument with his wife, um, goes in the huff for two days, and then comes back. Bubum. That's the story. That happened to me once. I didn't end up in Mail Online. Right? It's a non-story. That happens every day. Why is it in Mail Online? I'll tell you why. Because they're using it to remind you of Gareth Huntley. So this story, this guy who's just wandered off from his wife. Last month, the body of Britain, Gareth Huntley, 34, from Cricklewood, London, was found in a turtle conservation resort in Malaysia. We can't trust the Malaysians. All right? So they're using any story that they can to try and demonize their regime. <coughs> So, you heard it here first. It wouldn't surprise me if there's military action in Malaysia at some point in the next five years. But what they have to do, they have to just 
do this psychological operation on the public so that it's not opposed. Now, I'm going to talk about freedom of expression because I think this links in to this um, agenda to break down trust in society. This is Section 5 of the 1986 Public Order Act. Up until very recently, it was illegal to insult someone, right? But the police were abusing this law. Anyone who was shouting something out in the crowd, the police were using it just to arrest them. And what is an insult to one person could be a compliment to someone else. So freedom of speech groups were really annoyed at this law, that it was being abused, and they wanted it reformed. Right? So they started a campaign in May 2012 to drop that word insulting from the law. So it would not be illegal to insult people. Right? Now one person who was um, very prominent in this campaign was Ron Atkinson. And he spoke about it at a, at a news conference or at a conference on the 16th of October 2012. I'm just going to show you some extracts from it. Uh, my starting point when it comes to the consideration of any issue relating to free speech is my passionate belief that the second most precious thing in life is the right to express yourself freely. The most precious thing in life, I think, is food in your mouth. And the third most precious is a roof over your head. But a fixture for me in the number two slot is free expression just below the need to sustain life itself. That is because I have enjoyed free expression in this country all my professional life and fully expect to continue to do so. So my concerns are less for myself and more for those more vulnerable because of their lower profile. Like the man arrested in Oxford for calling a police horse gay. <laughs> or the teenager arrested for calling the Church of Scientology a cult or the cafe owner arrested for displaying passages from the Bible on a TV screen. When I heard of some of these more ludicrous offences and charges, I remembered that I had been here before in a fictional context. I once did a show called Not the Nine O'Clock News some years ago, and we did a sketch where Griff Rhys Jones played Constable Savage, a manifestly racist police officer <laughs> to whom I, as his station commander, is giving a dressing down for arresting a black man on a whole string of ridiculous, trumped up and ludicrous charges. The charges for which Constable Savage arrested Mr. Winston Kodogo of 55 Mercer Road were these. Walking on the cracks in the pavement. <laughs> Walking in a loud shirt in a built-up area during the hours of darkness. And one of my favourites, walking around all over the place. <laughs> he was also arrested for urinating in a public convenience and looking at me in a funny way. Who would have thought that we would end up with a law that would allow life to imitate art so exactly. I read somewhere a defender of the status quo claiming that the fact that the gay horse case was dropped after the arrested man refused to pay the, uh, to pay the fine and that the Scientology case was also dropped at some point during the court process was proof that the law was working well, <laughs> ignoring the fact that the only reason these cases were dropped was because of the publicity that they had attracted. The police sensed that ridicule was just around the corner and withdrew their actions. But what about the thousands of other cases that did not enjoy the oxygen of publicity, that weren't quite ludicrous enough to attract media attention? Even for those actions that were withdrawn, people were arrested, questioned, taken to court, and then released. You know, that isn't a law working properly. That is censoriousness of the most intimidating kind, guaranteed to have, as Lord Deere says, a chilling effect on free expression and free protest. Merely stating an alternative point of view to the orthodoxy can be interpreted as insult. A new but intense desire to gag uncomfortable voices of dissent. The best way to increase society's resistance to insulting or offensive speech is to allow a lot more of it. Now, anyone remember seeing that on mainstream news? Why didn't they have their reporters there? 
Uh, and just one point, uh, who would you rather have as prime, next Prime Minister? <laughs> Mr Bean gets my vote every time. Um, and I'm going to come on to that in a, in a, in a second. Um, so what happened was there was a vote in the House of Lords and they voted quite strongly to get rid of that word insulting because of this campaign, 150 to 54. And the government didn't oppose it, uh, they just let it sail through and I think uh, they were probably aware that if they had opposed it, they would have been ridiculed by the likes of Rowan Atkinson because it is a ridiculous law. All right? So that came into force on the 1st of February 2014 and I suspect the government weren't happy about having to change that law because it takes away police powers of arrest. It says that well, you can shout things out at people if you want to, you know, as long as it's not abusive, if it's just insulting. Um, now, I'm just going to write... Rowan Atkinson's name next to him there. Two months after that law was changed, right, um, and I think Rowan Atkinson was probably instrumental in that happening, someone with his influence and following, um, this newspaper headline appeared. Now, this story, right, it turned out was completely false. There was not an, el not an element of truth in it that these giant rats had been discovered somewhere in the UK. So this is a total lie. In my opinion, the main thing that's going on in this, in this front page is Rowan Atkinson, and that story's been put there as a subliminal, right? Rowan Atkinson, right? Look at the way that the tail is hanging down from his neck. You might ask, well, why would they do that on the front page of a newspaper? If you think about news, it is a bit more fragmented than it used to be. You have got a lot of channels on Sky, you've got the internet, but one place that still has millions of captured viewers is newspaper stands. So if one million people have bought that newspaper, I would suggest 10 million people have read the front page. So you've still got a vast amount of people looking at that, and that goes straight into your subconscious. Right? In my opinion, this is a subconscious attempt to nudge the public to a place where they don't really approve of Ron Atkinson. Because can you imagine Ron Atkinson in, in a debate with Ed Miliband or David Cameron? You know, he was very statesmanlike in that clip, wasn't he? He was speaking from his heart. Just compare that to Miliband, the clip that I showed you. They do not want their puppets upstaged by an intelligent, witty man like Ron Atkinson. So this is manipulation of the worst kind, in my opinion. Subconscious planting of suggestion. Okay, here's another subliminal. This is a Kate McCann subliminal, or McCann story. So the bottom right-hand corner there is a separate advert, and it's for the Financial Services Authority. Why the Financial Services Authority need to advertise in the first place, I don't know. But they've chosen to put the title of their advert as The Truth, right under where it says, Missing Madeline and Mum Kate. I don't think that's an accident. Okay, now, after that law changed, round about seven or eight months after, these ridiculous stories about modern-day slavery started appearing in our press. And they're all bogus, in my opinion. They're all exaggerations and concoctions. It's a Hegelian dialectic. So they're creating a problem, uh, then a reaction, and then they're going to come up with a solution. And the solution is to bring in a new law, which I'm going to explain to you. But they've got to get these stories in the media first, before they bring in this draconian new law. One story caught my eye as a classic contrived Hegelian dialectic problem-reaction-solution farce. The story of three women rescued from a house in Lambeth after allegedly being held as slaves for 30 years. Hmm. This story was put out by most, if not all, of our gutter press. The BBC website said, a Malaysian woman, 69, an Irish woman, 57, and a Briton, 30, were rescued on the 25th of October. It emerged on Thursday. A man, 73, and a woman, 67, understood to be married, were arrested in Lambeth and later bailed until January. The Home Secretary, Theresa May, said details were still emerging in Lambeth, South London, but it was clear that many other victims were hidden in plain sight across the country. It transpired that one of these so-called slaves had been working, wait for it, drum roll, in a nail bar. Mm. I'm enslaved in a nail bar, please let me out. I can assure you a nail bar is not the sort of place I would want to be enslaved in either. 
I spent thirty years imprisoned against my will. Oh, really? Where did you do your time? Wandsworth nail bar. Really? The screws are really cruel in them nail bars. They only allow five minute fag breaks, and you have to stick to set fingernail designs. There was just no artistic freedom there. If a person abuses another person, do we not already have laws that deal with this? Theresa May then starts going on saying that we need to deal with modern day slavery by inventing new laws. Thousands of Geordie men will be getting locked up for being heard to utter the forbidden words, make me a cup of tea, pet. I then saw a psychologist being interviewed talking about how charismatic people with strong personalities can start cults with the aim of enslaving people and how we need to protect ourselves against them. Hmm, so that's what this is all about, controlling people who spread ideology, or perhaps even the truth. This farcical story shows just how scared the manipulators are of certain ideas which are growing in the public mindset. Ideas that are based on truth. That's it. The truth is the greatest enemy of the state. And this applies to the UK right here, right now. New laws to clamp down on modern day slavery are being laid down to stamp out the enemy of the state. The truth. All right, so there was a number of completely ridiculous stories about supposed modern day slavery and then just very recently we had the Queen's speech. A bill will be introduced to strengthen the powers to prevent modern slavery and human trafficking while improving support for victims of such crimes. So they've, so they've planted their bogus stories, they've created a bit of interest in it and now the Queen is saying we need new laws and they're, they're intending to bring these new laws in in the next Parliament. Now one thing that tells me is that the manipulators who are orchestrating all this operating with the Crown, the government and the media, all as one, right? Because they need all three in order, for that, in order to be able to bring in what I'm going to describe to you in a second. <coughs> Now here's, there are two draft slavery bills, which these are proposed as going to be new laws. Um, there's the government draft slavery bill and there's the joint committee draft bill. They both define what they mean by slavery and what they're going to make illegal. Now, the top one is the government one, the second one is the joint committee one. I'm going to selectively read the joint committee one. Um, for the purposes of this act, slavery means the control by a person of a second person in such a way as by which any person obtains a benefit through the use, management, profit, transfer or disposal of that second person. If I ask anyone in this audience to go to the bar and get me a pint of lager, I'll give you the money you give me, I've broken the law. I've broken that law. That, that is a law against um, having someone do you a favour. That's what that is. Now, this one's not quite as bad, but neither of these laws talk about whether the person has agreed to do that favour. So they're making the doing of favours or requesting a favour illegal. That's what they're trying to do. This one says, P requires another person to perform forced or compulsory labour and the circumstances are such that P knows or ought to know that the person is being required to perform forced or compulsory labour. I mean, that's just completely ambiguous and I don't see how it's enforceable. I can envisage situations in three or four years' time where you might have a married couple or two friends or any sort of club where they fall out. We have, people fall out in their day-to-day -day lives, yeah? So they think, all those favours I did for them, is that the police? I've been enslaved for the last three years. The courts are going to be full, right? Now, I ran a campaign in 2012 called Tell Your MP About 7-7, where 100 people went on my website, they downloaded some documents and printed them out and took them to their MPs. They could have me locked up for doing that if this law is passed. This is a very, very dangerous law. It's trying to make requesting favours from someone illegal. And in a place like here, the Welsh Valleys, where there is a very good community spirit, I, I find p people will help you and will not request payment, what's it going to do? Every time you want someone to do something or are communicating with someone, you're going to be scared to ask them to do something. That's going to erode trust, isn't it? In the, the, the cement which holds us all together. Do, do we really want this? Because we've got laws 
We've got employment law, right? We've got minimum wage. So they're not, this is, they're not talking about employment here, right? And they're not talking about shackling someone in, in, in traditional type slavery. They're talking about what they mean by mental slavery. Sorry, what they mean by modern slavery. They mean mental slavery. They're saying we're going to try and control what you can say to someone. So they're limiting your freedom of expression. And it's, this is very, very dangerous. Now, I was going to, I've written to my MP to complain about this. I do not want this law passed. And I was going to ask you lot to do the same, but I, I'm not sure now because I might get done for enslaving you. <laughs> but just think about the implications of this law. It's not, this in my opinion, is not being brought in to stop people being taken advantage of. It's the opposite. It's a, sub, it's a Yuri Besmanov subversion technique, and it will have a very detrimental effect on society. Now I'm going to talk about the censorship of my TV show because um, several people have asked me today, is it coming back on television? Well, I'm not really, I'm not 100% sure. Um, as you may know, I got removed from TV for about nine months um, because of an item that I put on where I was challenging the, the official line of the Woolwich incident where some guy allegedly had his head hacked off in the middle of the street. Um, now Ofcom produced this report as to why they said that my program was offensive and what I've done is I've taken all of their quotations from my show and I've clipped them all together. So this is why my show was taken off air. One important factor is there is no photograph or video showing a decapitated corpse. We can see a body lying in the road, but it's not obvious whether there's even a head there or not. We do right, so you're supposed to believe that in that corner of the pavement with trees overhead, they tried to hack his head off. They suddenly got out of the meat killer, tried to hack his head so off. So this is off the road they've tried to do this, Yeah, on, on the pavement. All right. Now that would have, about eight pints of blood would have spurted out if they'd done that. There had blood all over themselves, which they didn't have. And, there's, uh, and the important thing is there's no blood on the pavement. You happen to have a meat cleaver, you get out, you hack his head off, why would you want to do that? And you then drag him out into the middle of the road. Uh, uh, it makes absolutely no sense. It's the only sense it makes is as a stage prop for public horror. Right, so okay. just ask yourself, if, if you had seen somebody hack someone's head off and got blood all over his hands with a meat cleaver, uh, would you stand there a few feet in front of him with a camera photographing him and talking to him? Well, would you course, do no, that? Of course you wouldn't. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> that is an obviously staged event. Uh, and the, the dead giveaway here is the little old lady with a shopping trolley who walks past, totally unconcerned, as this apparent right. horror event is going on. Mm -hmm. And that tells you uh, that, 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 that red blood on the hand was photoshopped on. There was no red blood on the hands. Uh, and it's only on his hands, not anywhere else on his clothing, as would have happened if... if right, you know. so, they've, so they've done a very badly orchestrated false flag event in Boston, now yeah. they've done one in, in Woolwich in the UK. Well, well, is, is, it, is, can is, I just is, put is this it? to you? That, that, that you've got the people who do see through these lies, okay, such yeah. as yourself, people who actually critically analyse, look at the evidence and see if there's any mileage in what the mainstream is saying, and then unpick it and then we know it's all a fake event, okay, it's easy to see. Right, now I would have been quite happy to issue an apology if that is indeed offensive. This is one complaint that uh, Ofcom got, and after I was taken off air, the TV company got 400 complaints from viewers. So where's the democracy there? But I would have been quite happy to issue an apology and continue on in the same vein with the same types of programs I've been producing. But that has not been allowed to happen, because... Um, the TV company are so scared now of, produce, of producing anything which questions the government's narrative or uh, anything against, let's say, police corruption and this kind of thing, that they only want programs about UFOs from me. That's all they're prepared to air because they're worried about getting a £30,000 fine and getting their licence taken off them. So my hands are tied now. I can't put certain things out that challenge authority. And the other thing they've done is they've requested more money from me for, for the shows. So the last series of 13 shows that I put out, the TV company want £3,000 plus VAT from me. So I pay to produce the programmes and then I have to pay them three grand plus VAT to get them to put them on. Right? I don't get paid to make these TV shows. So that's why um, I'm charging £12 instead of 10 because I've agreed to give the TV company 30% of the proceeds from these talks. So I'm subsidising the TV show, right? The other thing they've done is they've stuck me on at midnight and a lot of people have been having problems recording the show as well. So, and this is ongoing, yeah? So that one incident is, is still affecting my freedom of speech now because I'm not allowed to say 
um, the sorts of things that I'm saying in this talk on television. All right? So I'm not sure what, which direction I want to take. Am I just going to broadcast on the internet? Or am I just going to do just UFO stuff and stay, and stay on television? Now, I've mentioned subversive influences, and um, a lot of people say, well, what can you do? Because um, not everyone's going to go to Portugal and try and make a documentary that's going to un undermine the government and what I'm doing. But there are things that you can do, and I I've had a little think about this, regarding subversive influences. Here's one of them. Throw your television set out of the window. Right, if you don't want to do that. The first point is that your armour or your guidance comes from within yourself. That sounds a little bit religious, but it's true. You're not going to get it from anyone else. You're not going to get it from any, um, anything that you read. It comes from within yourself, right? Your, your, your armour against subversive influences. Try and know or learn which influences to shut off from. Write them down. I, mean, I haven't even mentioned films and, and radio. Anyone listen to the Jeremy Vine show? That is just the most disgusting, fear-mongering... I, I put that on for 15 seconds before I've, I've had enough of it. Jeremy Vine. Um, so know or learn which influences to shut off from. And think carefully about what you put value on. So the Peppa Pig stuff that I showed you before, Peppa doesn't like nature. So they're trying to make people worship material things. They're, um, they're trying to create consumerist material, materialism. If you don't have your health, you're not going to have any of it. Yeah? Um, don't spend long periods under subversive influences. I only watch the news for about 15 minutes every week. That's all you need in order to get up on the propaganda. Yeah? You don't need to sit in front of the TV for long periods of time. And give the influencers labels which describe what they really are. Dancing on shite. Um, I call Greg's dregs. And there are many others. Make them up. I call the new, I don't say, well, are we going to put the news on? I say, are we going to put the stress on? Um, but it's not always as simple as that, is it? Because... And it's not always the woman who's addicted, the, addicted to subversive influences. Sometimes it's the man or it might be teenage, uh, teenagers or grandparents or whatever, whatever your situation is. You might be living in the same space as someone who can't get enough of all of this and you just want to switch off from it. What the hell do you do? Because a lot of people contact me about that and we saw this, the comment in the slide that she never has the soaps on. It's, not, it's, not, it's quite a tricky thing, but I've had to think about it. The first, this, this comes from cognitive behavioral therapy, which can be used for the positive. It's not all mind control. So write a letter from the other person's perspective. So imagine that you are that other person and explain to yourself why you need all of these subversive influences. That will then enable you to understand where they're coming from. Then put yourself in an imaginary trial. So there's a, a judge, a jury, and the other person. What would you say to that jury to convince them that all of the subversive influences are completely bad and ought to be um, taken away from your life? Right? But once you've done that, imagine that the other person who loves the subversive influences is drowning in a river. Now, if they were drowning in a river, would you point at them and say, stop drowning in that bloody river? Because they are drowning in a river of subversion. You wouldn't, would you? They need support. So no, it's not their fault. It's the subverters' fault. They're victims of subversion, people who are addicted to this stuff. No ticking off, right? They're victims. They need support. Talk to their heart before their head and show some compassion. Try and get them to propose a solution, an alternative to just being absorbed in these subversive influences, and then they're more likely to follow the solution. And recognize and give gratitude if they give suggestions. All right, well, if we put the lights back on now, um, that's the end of part one. We'll have a 20-minute break, and I'll see you in part two to talk about the Secret Space Program. Thank you. Yeah.